Hello, uh, everybody, and welcome to this media telecon after our independent study on UAP, that's uh, Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena. Uh, we hope you were, if you're here for the media, that you had the opportunity to watch the public broadcast today. We will have a link for that up shortly, so you can go back and, and look at it. We will be focusing today mostly on Q&A. We're not going back over all the things we discussed today, so we will be leaving the most time we can for media to ask questions. I am Karen Fox with NASA's Office of Communications. And we will start with just a couple of minutes of introductory remarks, and then we will go quickly into the Q&A. Uh, a warning for you, if you did not have the opportunity to watch the broadcast today, we have many people here today. We are going to try very hard to be uh, good about making sure each person says their name ahead of time. Uh, you should feel free to write us in the Office of Communications if for some reason you missed a name, but we will uh, do our best to, to get you all the names as we go. Uh, once we do questions, you will be invited to press star 1 to get in the queue to ask a question. Without further ado, I will toss to two of our panelists, Dan Evans and David Spurgle. Each one is going to give just a couple minutes overview of what this uh, independent study is about and what was accomplished today, and then we'll move right into our Q&A portion. Great. Thanks very much, Karen. So uh, something I mentioned this morning that I'd like to read iterate this afternoon is that this subject of unidentified anomalous phenomena, UAPs, if you will, has truly captured the attention of the public, of the scientific community, uh, and nowadays the U.S. government as well. And we at NASA strongly believe that it's our responsibility, all working together, to investigate these occurrences and to provide the sort of rigorous scientific scrutiny that NASA is well known for. Uh, our boss, the NASA administrator, Senator Bill Nelson, truly believes that studying UAPs is incredibly important, uh, not least because it provides an opportunity for us to expand our understanding of the world around us. And given NASA's roots in exploration, as I said this morning, this work is in our DNA. Secondly, we are approaching this study highly cognizant of the fact that uh, there is a situational awareness aspect. The presence of UAPs undoubtedly raises concerns about the safety of our skies, and it's our responsibility, again, working together, to investigate whether those anomalies, those phenomena, pose any risks to airspace safety. Um, what we're doing now is we have brought together this team of 16 experts, all of whom are absolutely top-notch experts in their respective fields, and pulled them together in a highly interdisciplinary approach. We've tasked them with helping NASA produce a roadmap, a roadmap that doesn't necessarily look back at previous grainy footage, it sort of acknowledges that many UAPs historically will never be able to get to the bottom of because the data are of such poor quality. So we're trying to assess whether those phenomena pose any risks to airspace safety, and we're doing it using science. NASA believes that the tools of science apply to the study of UAP because they allow us to separate fact from fiction. And that's all part of NASA's commitment to exploring the unknown and doing so with the openness, transparency, and candor that we're well accustomed to providing the public. I'll pass it over to David. Uh, thanks, Dan. So as Dan noted, our goal here is to provide a roadmap for how NASA can contribute to understanding. And in doing so, you know, mindful of the uh, AARO's role as leading the whole of government UAP effort. Um, but NASA has some really unique capabilities. It is the civilian agency. It has, uh, its data is open. It handles things in a transparent manner. And as such, I think is the best suited to interact with both the citizen scientists and scientists 
uh, professional scientists engage with us. We've gone through a data collection stage, which has continued with the, uh, our uh, hearing today. And I think what we've seen is that many events have conventional explanations. We saw uh, more of this today, that many of these events are commercial aircraft, civilian and military drones, weather and research balloons, military equipment, weather phenomena, ionospheric phenomena. Um, that said, we ha there are remain events that uh, we do not understand. Um, but these events tend to be characterized by uh, poor quality and limited data. And I think one of the lessons we've drawn is the need for more high quality data and data that is uh, well calib measured with well calibrated instruments, multiple observations, uh, and uh, that there's a need for high for quality data curation in order to assess these events. Um, we we have not yet made our recommendations. Uh, we're still at the stage of developing our report. So we just, uh, we're, everything we say now are, represents really preliminary observations. Our report will be out, we hope, by the end of July, and that report will be fully open. And um, at, you know, it's really only at that stage that we can, we will have uh, consensus recommendations that we will be presenting to NASA. And uh, these will be a report that we will send. Uh, through the uh, Earth Science Advisory Board, which will pass that on to NASA headquarters. All right, uh, thank you so much. As I mentioned, we will move on to the Q&A portion of this. And to ask a question, please press star one. Star one, uh, and I'll remind our panelists to say your name first when you, when you answer. Uh, and our first question, is going to be from Steve Crabtree of BBC, please. Hello, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, yes we can. Yes. Fantastic. I should start just by saying, uh, Dan, um, I can tell from your accent that you're from the UK. So I uh, began my career at the BBC on Tomorrow's World. I currently look after the sky at night, and I was the editor of Horizon for five years. So the chances are you could probably appeared in one of my programs. And um, David Spargle, David, I did a presentation for the Simons Foundation last year about science and science fiction, which my friend Yvette uh, Modinu uh, organized. My question is very television, though, I'm afraid, um, but it's very straightforward, which is I'm just very curious as to whether you've discussed what to do if you actually do discover that UAPs are extraterrestrial, because that would suggest an advanced te technology. And we know clearly what, what happens certainly on the earth when, a, when an advanced civilization meets a less advanced civilization. So I'm just curious as to whether that has been discussed as a, as a group um, where, with everyone on, on, on the panel that has done this um, brilliant presentation this afternoon. Um, that was actually not, I mean, that's a fascinating question. I think one all, probably many of us have speculated about, but not one that was in our charge. So that was David Spurgel speaking, and we're going to go to David Grinspoon next. Oh, yeah. Um, again, as, uh, as David mentioned, uh, this is David Grinspoon. Uh, it's not something we've spent uh, time um, thinking about too much as a, as a panel because it's not really in our, in our remit. But, uh, you know, in the astrobiology community, uh, I can tell you um, that, uh, of course, it comes up a lot, what happens if we're successful, and even more specifically, not just with finding extraterrestrial life, but what happens if um, uh, SETI detects a signal or we otherwise get uh, what seems like convincing evidence of, uh, you know, that we aren't alone in the universe. And um, there's pretty much complete consensus in that community that that uh what we do is is share that knowledge with the world that any any uh concern that we as scientists might have about the repercussions of that and you know we could that's a longer discussion about what, what we think that may be but that's sort of not not our job our job is to investigate the universe and share what we find and so i think you will find that that would be the attitude in the scientific community is to, just uh to uh to share what we find 
Great. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on to our second question, which is from Marsha Dunn of the AP. Uh, yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Okay. Um, I was struck by Mike Gold's comment that there's probably plenty of stigma surrounding the topic right there at NASA headquarters. And given that, how hard was it to kick off this study by NASA, and how hard was it to get 16 open-minded people to serve on the panel, um, also considering that they've been bombarded with online um, attacks? And, and also, why not just call these UFOs? Why UAPs? And furthermore, why switch the A from aerial to anomalous, because that makes it even a bigger mouthful to say thanks. All right. So lots of questions there. How do we start? This started with the NASA Administrator, Senator Bill Nelson, wanting to better understand UFOs. And that, in large part, is based on the considerable uh, work that he did when he was in the U.S. Senate. But, and I wanted to actually pay you know, a major credit to Senator Nelson for for doing this because you know, this has not historically been in NASA's remit. And so it's very rewarding that he has the confidence in NASA science to take a scientific look in this because the administrator believes, as do we, that the tools of science apply here also. Now, how do you go about assembling a team of experts to come and do this task. And again, I wanted to pay tribute to this incredible group that I'm proud to sit on the stage with right now. Uh, this is a complex task. We recognize that there is a need for expertise in multiple scientific disciplines. So we sought out recognized authorities in their respective fields who could approach this investigation from diverse perspectives. And yes, given the sensitivity and the stigma associated with the topic, it, it is important to find individuals uh, who are willing to participate in this endeavor. And I can tell you that we had nobody turn us down. Everybody on stage is, is our first choice because they collectively bring an incredible diversity of expertise. Uh, to this task, and then combined that diversity leads us to uh, truly, I think, profound places. Uh, let me address another question, and forgive me if I didn't get to every single one of your, your sub-questions. Um, the term UAP, originally unidentified aerial phenomena, uh, was changed by the National Defense Authorization Act, which was signed into law in December 2022, I believe. Um, to unidentified anomalous phenomena. And that was principally in recognition of the fact that um, one should expand our search beyond just uh, airspace to potentially include near space and undersea phenomena as well. And uh, consistent with that law, then NASA accordingly changed our, um, our charge to encompass multiple domains. Now, why don't we call it UFOs? I think because of the stigma associated with UFOs. This is a, a serious business. Uh, I think many experts have told us about the potential risks to U.S. airspace safety. And I think also because uh, we want to employ the rigorous scientific method that NASA is accustomed to, to providing, I think it's actually good practice to call uh, these events UAPs, not UFOs. Hey, Dan, I, I, uh, I, I could be mistaken, but I, I thought it was actually in the Defense Authorization Act of 2022 is where this study was um, requested. No. Not, it was not? No. So, okay. so the, the NDAA, Scott, um, actually authorized the establishment of the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, Aero. Um, in the NDAA that was signed in for 21, I believe, 22 exactly, so 22, excuse me. All right, and uh, it's Senator Nelson, the NASA Administrator, that, that directed that this study take place for NASA, right? 
And for those online, that was Scott Kelly who was responding to Dan. Hi, uh, Marcia. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, moving on to our next question. Uh, Gina Sanseri with ABC News. Yes, this question is for Dr. Drake if she's available. Well, you talked about the roadmap to this, but what would the roadblocks be to that roadmap? What are the hurdles that need to be overcome? Hi, Gina. Um, thank you for the question. This is Nadia. I think I'm actually going to toss that one over to Dr. Spurgel, our chair, to address what the possible roadblocks could be. I mean, I think there's I mean, a, a lot of different kinds of roadblocks. I mean, a lot of them are sort of, you know, I feel in addressing this issue, we steer between uh, the rocks and the cyclone. We have a community of people who are completely convinced of the existence of UFOs. And we have a community of people who think addressing this question is ridiculous because UFOs do, you know, everything can be explained. And uh, so to me, that's the greatest roadblock we we what faces here. And I think as scientists, the way to approach questions is you start by saying, we don't know. And then you collect data and you try to calibrate your data well. And uh, to go to an analogy we talked about earlier, the first step if you want to find needles in haystacks or don't even know to look what you're looking for is you want to learn and characterize the haystack really well. And if you understand hay well and how you measure and observe hay well, you can find things. But that's, that's not an approach that, that we have a community. I think the biggest challenge is you have a community out there that says that haystack is filled with gold and another community saying, it's nuts to look in a haystack for anything interesting. There's nothing there. So I think, to me, that's the greatest challenge in this area. The both coming at you with That's right. <laughs> that was Josh Sumetter. Yeah, Josh, Josh Sumetter. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to move on to the next question, which is uh, Bill Harwood with CBS News. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, this is for anyone, really, but when you say there are events that, that, you know, after you've ruled out things that are obvious, that there are some events that simply can't be understand at this, understood at this point, what does that actually mean? And, and what I'm asking is, is that more a case of the data that you have, either due to quality, the age of it, subjective accounts, whatever, that the data just isn't good enough to reach a conclusion, or does it mean the data might be good, but what you're seeing is something that cannot be understood in terms of known technology, or is it both? All right, Federica Bianco. Hi. Uh, so I think you actually hit the nail in the head. The, um, the data that we have seen is generally sparse, poor, difficult to analyze, and in the cases in which it's best, we can determine the nature of the things that look weird, even if they look weird, by, you know, remeasuring them more accurately and actually finding out that they don't move so fast after all, um, and so on. Um, there are many cases in which we might be under the impression that there might be something anomalous, but the data is just not sufficient to support an analysis that would allow us to um, really understand um, either the shape or the behavior in, in motion um, or the reflectivity property of the object, so it just cannot be said with the current data. Um, it's very possible that with better data they will be reconciled with known phenomena. All right. Moving on to our next question, we have Marina Corin from The Atlantic. Hi, thank you. Um, I have two questions. The first is for any panelists who would like to take it. Uh, can you tell us more about the online harassment that you received and were you surprised to get such harassment? 
Um, and then a question for either David Spurgle or David Grinspoon or both Davids. Um, you said near the end of today's meeting that scientists are looking for life beyond Earth actively, obviously, and you mentioned technosignatures as one way that you're doing that. Um, you both also said that NASA should help remove the stigma around UAPs. So do you think that NASA should consider the study and analysis of UAPs as a way of looking for evidence of life beyond Earth? Thank you. Great. We're going to start with Dan Evans. Okay, so I'm going to address the, the first question, which was surrounding online harassment as a panelist. And, you know, although I won't get in, into specifics, I will point out that if you were watching the NASA YouTube feed this afternoon and looking at the, the live chat that's on the, the side of that panel, then you can sort of see some of the, the online trolling. That just is, um, that's really the tip of the iceberg. I think the important point is actually this, that if we are truly to approach UAP with an unwavering commitment and dedication to the scientific process, then harassment of any nature only serves to detract from that process. And of course, we see this not just in, in UAP, but in other fields of science as well. Uh, I will underscore something that I said earlier today, is that every single member of our team is a respected authority in their field. They have NASA's complete and total support. And this is hard work. It's serious work. And if we are truly to respect the sanctity of the scientific process, then we allow, need to allow science indeed to be free. And that freedom stems directly from an absence of harassment to this incredible team of panelists. All right, and I believe the second question was to either David Spurgel or David Grinspoon. Yeah, um, this is David Grinspoon. Um, it's an interesting question because, you know, as I indicated in, in my talk during the panel, there is conceptually a connection perhaps between um, astrobiology and SETI and the study of UAPs in that, um, you know, it's a big universe and, and we have to admit that there are things out there we don't understand and, in fact, in some of those not, not well understood or not, not understood um, phenomena may be um, really important um, clues to, uh, you know, think, think, the, to, to I important mysteries that, that, that we want to understand. Um, if you were giving me a finite pot of uh, resources right now to, to look for uh, biosignatures and technosignatures, w would I put some of that, those resources into studying UAPs? Personally, probably not, because as we said, we haven't seen any evidence that indicates that UAPs have anything to do with extraterrestrial phenomena. So, so to me, it's much more straightforward as a as a application of our, our curiosity about extraterrestrial life to look at exoplanets, to look elsewhere in the solar system. Um, so, so I, I don't. We don't have reason yet to explicitly, explicitly connect UAPs with that study in that way. However. Um, as long as there's a mystery, uh, be it on Earth or wherever, we have to pursue it. And if the data leads us to, um, to realize that it does have something to do with extraterrestrial life, of course we'll be um, enthralled and fascinated by that and want, want to pursue it. But at this point, we don't really have any explicit data that um, suggests to us that there's a connection between UAPs and uh, extraterrestrial life. Thank you so much. Moving on to the next question, which is from Jeff Brumfield of NPR. Oh, hi there. I am sorry to kind of belabor Marina's uh, question, but actually the, uh, the online chat for the live stream was closed, at least on YouTube. So I was wondering if you could just be, I, I'm not asking for names, just a little more explicit about the type of harassment. And is it, is it harassment you're receiving from people who believe aliens are real or people who believe this is a ridiculous question or both, sort of getting back to David Spurgle's um, rock and hard place point. So just before I pass that uh, question off, I would like to point out that there were, in fact, two YouTube videos going live today. Uh, uh, 
one has has all of that, and we will be sharing. You know, there will be a permanent version going up, so so you'll be able to watch watch that. And I do think it is one of the best places to see an example because we're of course in a position where, you know, based on privacy and security reasons, we're we're not able to give examples. No, no, just a general sense of where this is, which can you know, you don't have to point fingers, just more of a general sense of what's going on. Great. Dan Evans will give a response. I, I think every one of the, the 16 strong panel, uh, plus myself, <laughs> receives on a, on a daily basis emails of, uh, of all sorts <laughs> um, concerning this subject. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about... Uh, specific attacks on, you know, the, the, the character of, of individuals and their suitability to sit on this panel. Um, and, and, and again, that's really just scratching the surface. Um, I'll go back to the remark I made previously that if, if we are to follow science, which is exactly what the American public expects of this agency, then science needs to be free to conduct its process uh, and I think Paula's got a follow-up. Yeah, um, this is Paula Bontempi. I just wanted to add to that um, two things. First, you know, the, um, when the panel was announced, I'm an oceanographer by trade, and I'm the dean of a graduate school of oceanography, and I had a lot of um, people asking what possible role an oceanographer could play on this panel. Um, and I'm a, you know, I'm a... Um, satellite oceanographer. I am also an optical oceanographer, and so one of the points I think the panel has repeatedly made today is about how um, when you blend multiple communities that do and utilize different observations and data and analyses uh, for their science together, we tend to really break boundaries and push new frontiers in discovery, um, and that is exactly what NASA is about, and I would add one thing to it, and I would not call it harassment, but one of the really interesting um, accounts that we did get first person was by uh, somebody who um, was a pilot who had uh, witnessed uh, an anomalous event and uh, reported it, and the one thing that that person said was how many people would contact that person and just want to give their account of what they had experienced. Um, this goes to the stigma of reporting. These were people that had a story to tell and didn't know where to tell it or didn't feel safe telling it. And I think the other thing we've covered today is how to go about destigmatizing reporting, right? Um, that also gives us more data with which to address um, understanding reported events. So I think it all goes hand in hand. Thanks so much. Our next question is from Joey Roulette with Reuters. Thanks. Um, I don't know who is best to answer this question, but it's about, I guess, the overcoming, you know, the issue of, of the low calibrated data. Do you, does this panel expect to recommend that a satellite or any kind of other sensor system um, should be dedicated to spotting UAPs or UFOs? What would that look like exactly? And also, if UAP now encompasses near space, was space part of the study or any of your findings? And if not, why uh, did that not, you know, produce any kind of data that was discussed today? Sorry if I missed something out front, but yeah. So I, I don't think we will, this is David Spurgle. Um, you know, while, while we haven't reached our conclusions yet, I do not think we'd be recommending a, a dedicated satellite. Um, satellites cover a relatively small, you have a trade-off with a satellite. You can either cover a lot of the planet at very low resolution, far too low to yield anything interesting here, or you can cover only a very small portion of the planet. So I, I think a dedicated satellite would not be a very effective approach. Um, we have been discussing ways in which we could engage citizen scientists engage the public in ways in which they could help collect data, take advantage of an interest. Um, that will require well-calibrated instruments. Um, you know, I think we will be thinking through potential recommendations in that area um, and, uh, you know, and see where we, we go from there. But I, I do not see uh, just the limitations of 
uh, how many pixels you have on a satellite. It's a big planet to cover at the resolution that you would need to continuously look for for events. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Shane Harris with the Washington Post. Hey there, thanks for doing this. Um, and, uh, related questions uh, regarding the um, uh, the data that you had access to. Did you have access to military or intelligence agency data, including things like radar tracking information? And did the panel have any access to classified information sources? And if the answer is no to any of those, would that kind of information be more helpful in reaching more definitive conclusions? Um, the answer is no. This is an unclassified panel. We didn't have access to that. But uh, our role was, you know, as I think we said at the beginning, background noise there, was really more to provide a roadmap to NASA on how it can contribute. The AARO is charged with being the lead agency on this. They have access to the classified data, and they, they have issued regular reports on this and plan to issue additional reports. It's really uh, their responsibility to look through the classified data. I hope that was clear. We had a lot of background noise. Yep, no, that's clear. Thanks. And Dan uh, Evans wanted to weigh in as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just to underscore a few things that David said, the, the focus, our focus on unclassified data, uh, it's a strategic choice, and it's meant to prioritize transparency and public engagement. Uh, and by working with unclassified data uniquely, we at NASA can share our findings and methods with the public and the scientific community. And that's important because it allows open discussion, independent verification of the results, and, of course, those are key principles in scientific research. Uh, not only that, the use of classified data allows for wider collaboration, not just within the U.S. government, but also with our international partners, uh, our, our academia partners, and, of course, private industry. Uh, it's important to note that the use of classified data doesn't necessarily preclude collaboration with agencies that handle classified information, such as the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. Um, and yeah, uh, such collaboration can occur as appropriate and necessary, but really the, the focus of this work is on unclassified. So this is David Sproul. Let me just add something on classification, which is most data is classified because how it's taken, not what's in the image. You know, if an F-35 takes a picture of a bird, it's classified with military camera. If an intelligence satellite, a satellite takes an image of a balloon from space, it's classified. So, you know, uh, in many cases around these events, the classification is done not to, to hide the nature of the event, but in order to protect um, our, our, our technical capabilities for, uh, for studying, you know, and assessing uh, threats from potential adversaries. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Tim Fernholtz with Quartz. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us about this and for holding the public meeting. Um, just to maybe get you to, to talk a little bit more about what you might predict, uh, obviously you mentioned you're not interested in a NASA satellite for this. But based on the findings so far, is there any thought that NASA should have a, a program or program office dedicated towards thinking about UAPs in their research? So as I uh, – Mike Gold, look best on radio. Um, as we mentioned previously during the panel, I've been part of far too many – Blue Ribbon studies and groups uh, have produced reports that have just, you know, laid on the shelf. I think we have an inflection point, an opportunity here to the leadership that uh, Administrator Nelson has shown to institutionalize this and be able to tackle the issues that we've laid out in a comprehensive and serious fashion. And I think that requires a permanent office at NASA to effectively deal with the issues that we've laid out None of the topics or challenges here can be dealt with quickly, and it really requires a permanent solution. And I think that could be implemented for a modest financial cost. So that's certainly something, at least I personally, 
uh, will be pushing and recommending that we proceed with. If you don't institutionalize something at NASA, the fear is it can go away far too quickly. Thank you so much. Our next question, oh, wait, I take it back. Dan it's Evans wants to weigh in, too. Budget land. Um, the, the very fact, of course, that, that we're standing up this team and, and doing it in an extremely public setting, um, you know, that, that tells you that NASA takes this issue seriously. Um, but it's also true to say that the funding going forward is going to be determined within the larger context of NASA's overall budget. That is, of course, set annually by Congress, and the you know, specifics are going to uh, depend on a variety of factors, uh, you know, and that includes the extent of the work required, resources, and uh, an alignment of the UAP study with NASA's overall mission and goals. Um, as you know, of course, our budget is publicly available, um, and any allocations that this agency uh, would make regarding UAP would be transparent, subject to public and congressional scrutiny, as well as it should be. All right, now we're moving on to the next question, uh, which is from Brett Tingley with Space.com. Hello, thank you all for doing this. Um, given that the concepts of replicability and rep reproducibility are so fundamental to the scientific method, uh, to what extent can such an unpredictable and ephemeral phenomenon such as UAP truly fit into a scientific framework, given we can't predict when or where UAP will appear, and that there's such a severe lack of data, as outlined in the panel before. Thank you. Going to David Spurgle for that, and then to Federica Bianco. So this is one where in the discussions I, uh, earlier on I talked about um, fast radial bursts. This is something we're actually used to in astronomy. Some of the most interesting things are bursts that go off at unpredictable times at unpredictable locations. And the history of fast radio bursts here, I think, are instructive in that when they were first seen, um, they were doubted. People weren't sure they were there. Turned out that a class of fast radio bursts turned out to be associated with microwave ovens that were where the doors were open before they were turned off. That produced a distinctive signal that was identified. But ultimately, the fast radio burst turned out to be a exciting cosmological phenomenon, one whose discoverers just won the Shaw Prize uh, yesterday. So that kind of shows uh, sometimes, you know, that very much was an anomaly. Uh, sometimes anomalies are really interesting and point to um, novel physical phenomena. And I think there's a number of interesting lessons learned there. When, you know, initially you often find things that are intriguing. You have to study their nature. Sometimes they will turn out to have conventional explanations. Um, but ultimately, in order to really uh, detect and study, um, ano you know, anomalous events that are unpredictable, you have to decide figure out ways in which you can do dedicated observations and optimize your observational strategy to be able to do that. And I think that's, um, as we think about UAPs, I think we're informed by uh, previous successes in identifying uh, anomalies. Oh, Federica Bianca was going to go, but I think she feels that I think David, David covered it. Uh, fantastic. We'll move on to our next question, uh, which is uh, from Brandy Vincent of Defense Scoop. Thank you, and thank you all so much for doing this today. Um, first, and I'm sorry if I missed this one, but who is the new NASA science advisor that's embedding at Arrow? And is someone from DOD embedding at NASA? Tell me a little bit more about sort of what to expect and your thinking there. And then separately, you've confirmed that unclassified data isn't um, being used for NASA's current studies uh, by these outside experts. What's your response to criticism that if NASA is not using classified MASINT or SIGINT data held by NGA, DIA, and other DOD archives, that maybe it's not getting a full and accurate assessment for the public? Okay, so I, I can respond 
to those. This is Dan Evans again. Um, yeah, so we are shortly to send over a, a liaison officer to the Department of Defense, their All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. Um, this is Mr. Mark McInerney. Uh, he's sitting in the audience. Um, he is a tremendous expert on large-scale curation of data. Uh, he is uh, an employee of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and he, he really uh, runs the show when it comes to our Earth-observing assets. All that being said, I want to underscore again that NASA's interests in UAP do differ from the, the Pentagon and from the intelligence community. We are adopting a science focus here, and, and it is good because we believe that science has a seat at the table. Um, individuals such as Mark can translate into both domains between unclassified and classified data. Uh, but I will foot stomp a remark I made earlier, namely that we see true benefit to this team working solely on unclassified data. Because when you restrict yourself to those types of data, you can collaborate freely with academia, with industry, with international partners. And we need as many eyes on this subject as possible. So there's actually a huge advantage about it. And also, we can speak about it in public. Again, huge benefit for us to do it like this. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Andrea Leinfelder with the Houston Chronicle. Hi. Um, thanks for taking the questions. Um, first, I want to double check the AARO stat. Um, it, it said there have been more than 800 UAP sightings collected in the past 27 years. And of those, maybe 2 to 5 percent are truly anomalous. Um, is that correct? And then second, you know, data has been a really big part of the conversation today, but I'm really struggling to explain it just in a very simple way how we are going to collect better data. You know, you've talked about multiple sources, maybe using existing assets, but um, if you could just kind of give me more of a direct answer on how to collect better data for this random event. Um, thank you. Hi, this is uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick from uh, Arrow. Um, those stats are are correct. It's uh, we're currently tracking over 800 cases, um, and a few percent of those are truly anomalous. Uh, those numbers are going to change. Uh, they change weekly, and in our our final our annual report coming up here this summer, you'll get new numbers that'll come out. My hope is that as we build out our website, those statistics will be kept up in real time so people can just take a look at where we are in the picture. Uh, to answer your second question, I'll start and then I'll hand it over to you guys. Um, from a how do we get better data perspective, I spoke a little bit this morning about uh, analyzing the data sets that exist in current sensors, whether that's FAA sensors or overhead sensors, to look at what sensors can actually see the types of things that we're looking for, uh, which I also spoke about this morning. Um, and then further, um, we've got some purpose-built surveillance systems that we're deploying for just that purpose, to look for, search, and track uh, any of these objects over long periods of time so that we can get baseline pattern analysis, pattern of life analysis, so that we can understand what's normal and what's not normal. And then from there, uh, we will bootstrap ourselves up into what sort of signatures are we picking out and how do we refine our collection architecture to go after that. This will take time. It's, it's working through the data and the signatures that we have. It'll be a little bit of searching of some old data. It'll be looking at dedicated sensors in the future. Dan or David, over to you. Yeah, so the, something we are thinking about and this is, I would, you know, uh, as I said at the beginning, we're still, you know, we're not yet written our report. We're still in the stage of deliberating. Is uh, the use of cell phones? We have there's of order, I don't know, three to four billion cell phones in the world. The, um, it's a great citizen science opportunity, and cell phones record not only 
uh, images. We're all used to cell phone cameras, but they measure the local magnetic field. They are gravitometers. They measure sound. They, in, they encode enormous amount of information about the environment around them. They pick up GPS signals, so of accurate time stamps and location stamps. And something that uh, I think a number of us have been thinking about is, uh, you know, potentially uh, making a recommendation about NASA, um, in, you know, either internally or more likely externally, enlisting a company to develop an app that could record data in a uh, on cell phones and then perhaps um, supporting the development of a website in which this data would be uploaded. Um, if, an, if you have something seen by multiple cell phones with good timestamp data at multiple angles, you're able to infer uh, the location and velocity of that object. Um, most of the time that will tell you it's a plane, it's a balloon, whatever. And if it's something novel, you have high-quality, uniformly selected data that could be used and uh, then combined with um, other data sets like radar data, overhead data, and you, I think the way one would want to understand um, really, you know, first eliminate the normal and then identify anything interesting is have um, multi-platform data that one can combine in an interesting way. And I think the, uh, that's the... I think the way a number of us are thinking about how we might approach this. And Federica Bianco? Yeah, just to add that one of the things we emphasize multiple times today already is that the data needs to be well calibrated. So not only this, we need to collect large amounts of data, but the information, the metadata, so the information about the data has to be collected at the same time. So really an ideal platform will give you not only the data, but also a wealth of information about the sensor that then allows you to really understand the context in which the data was taken. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes left and many, many questions. So I am going to try and get through as many as we can, but please note when you ask your question and when you answer it, we might start uh, picking up the pace a little bit, even though I know that's not what any of us prefer to do. Um, all right, so our next question is Leonard David with Scientific American. Yeah, thanks for doing this. Um, I guess the question I've got is, you know, to what extent is the term UAP giving the folklore kind of mystique of UFOs, I and mean, we're talking Roswell crash, recovered aliens, public encounters, you know, on and on. Is that term UAP, could it have nothing to do with the possibility of other star folk visiting here? Uh, okay, we have somebody. Mike, are you going to jump in? Mike. Mike, <laughs> Mike hey, called? Hey, Leonard, it's good to hear your voice. This is Mike Gold. I think the very term UAP was intended to get away from the assumptions and baggage that are part of the term UFO. Again, I'm a recovering attorney, so I believe words matter. Words have power. And I think what was trying to be achieved with that terminology and what we're trying to do with this group is to be agnostic, to be objective, and to look at this issue purely from a scientific perspective without bias. So I believe that was the intent. Whether or not it's been you know, successful is up to you, but I think it was a valuable intent. And it's certainly a goal that we have this, with this group to eliminate the bias and to proceed from an objective scientific perspective. Thank you very much. Next question is from Doris Arusha from Inverse. Hello. Thank you for having this meeting. Um, so to clarify, how many of the 800 some odd UAP sightings has the 16-person group been able to view? Um, and of the um, several dozen UAP sightings that remain anomalous, um, are there hints of a natural origin for at least those that the 16-person team has access to view? Um, for example, could, this, could the uh, anomalous UAPs uh, be explained by something along the lines of sprites or ball lightning? Thank you. Yeah. So our, this is David Spurgle. Our remit was not really to go through those 800 events, right? That, that really is the, 
responsibility that Congress gave ARL. Our re- task was to develop a roadmap for NASA on how they could contribute, where to go. Yep, precisely that. Great. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Natalie Jonas with Aerospace America. Yeah, um, thanks for doing this meeting. I have a question for David Spurgle. So you mentioned the creation of an app to submit sightings and media taken by people across the country. Um, is this in production? Is this in production or just an idea to help um, sort of help centralize citizen science data? You know, our job is to make recommendations to NASA. So this is a, I would say, a potential recommendation since we haven't written our report yet. Uh, that we might make to NASA, and then NASA would make any decision on implementation. We're we're an independent advisory board. Um, you know, our our responsibility is to give advice. Um, as someone who has commissioned independent advisory boards, uh, NASA's responsibility is to listen to our advice, take it seriously, and then assess which aspects of it they want to follow. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, We will be sharing these recommendations, of course, when they are finished, and we will make them all public. Uh, Next question is from Keith Cowing with nasawatch.com. Hi, a question for Dr. Evans. Uh, This committee is engaged in the topic that I think everybody will agree the public is equating with the search for life life elsewhere in the universe, even if it isn't in the charter, even if you don't want to make that connection. And I get the whole stigma thing, the giggle factor, and the threats, trust me. But to be honest, NASA also allows some goofy sci-fi movies with aliens to be shot in their facilities with a big NASA logo. My question with regard to the whole transparency issue is, why is it that the NASA Astrobiology website, the NASA Citizen Science website, the NASA Education website all make no mention of this committee or the meeting today or the topic under discussion? And how can you really do this with a straight, amp- a straight face if you really don't want to just connect the obvious public interest with the program, Astrobiology, that has been set up to look for life in the universe? Okay. Um, firstly, I, I love, love your Twitter stream. I get so much information from it, so thank you for that. Um, look, point number one, and I want to emphasize this loud and proud that there is absolutely no convincing evidence for extraterrestrial life or associated with UAPs, anything like that. Um, I think that when we stood up this incredible team, we did so in recognition of the fact that we need to get to an answer without assuming an origin going in. And we also acknowledge that there could potentially be very serious risks to U.S. airspace as a result of us not necessarily knowing what is in our skies at a given time. And, of course, that has national security implications as well. Uh, To your point about astrobiology, well, of course, astrobiology primarily focuses on the search for life in the universe and the study of the the origins. And the the study of UAPs is truly a distinct undertaking in its own right. It has its own goals, its own methodologies, um, and that's primarily concerned with identifying the nature and origin of UAPs, not necessarily uh, connecting that with the search for extraterrestrial life. As I've said numerous times today, we are all committed to transparency and openness at NASA, and this is why we're holding these meetings or this meeting in such a public forum. This is why you've been able to see the the team really do science, and this is why we will be releasing the full report later this summer on our website. Thank you very much. Uh, If we move quickly, I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, So next up is Julian Barnes with the New York Times. Hi, thanks for taking the question. Um, uh, Clarification, you mentioned that there had been an uptick of reports after the 
Chinese spy balloon uh, transited the U.S. Do you have any further uh, information about how many more numbers uh, that, how many more reports that yielded? And then the geometry around the GoFast video was uh, pretty interesting. Do you have any other plans to do uh, similar explanations of the other Pentagon videos that might uh, explain why they could be optical illusions or things like that. Hi, this is Dr. Kirkpatrick from uh, Arrow. Let me answer your first question, uh, and then I'll, I'll tell you what our plans are going forward. So the, um, the uptick that was alluded to by uh, some of the panel members, uh, no, I don't have an exact number for you from... I guess February until now, uh, we can certainly do the math on what we reported in the last uh, annual report, which I believe had a cutoff date of, of December uh, to now, which is uh, when it was about 511 or so in last year's annual report, and it's over 800 now. That number changes all the time. A lot of the uptick we've had recently is mostly because we've integrated the FAA data which is, you know, over 100 new cases just alone in the last uh, few weeks. So, uh, but that covers many, many years' worth of data. That's not like all at once. So it's, it's a little bit of a, a misnomer to think all of that um, increase is just over the last few months. It it's covers many, many years. And all of that will be detailed, of course, in our, our report this summer. And as we get the website going and we can have all these statistics out there for everybody, they can see it all the time. Your second question on the analysis performed on, on one of those videos, that is ultimately our goal at Arrow is that we are going to do that level of analytics that level of scientific uh, deconvolution of all of these cases as we get them and we can work through them with the scientific community, with the intelligence community, reduce those to digestible forms that we can then declassify and put out on the website for people to look at along with all of the associated analysis. That's, that is the ultimate goal, as I've said in many occasions, as we've laid out the plans for how Aero is going to operate. And we will do that with our NASA team, uh, with our interagency team, with our scientific community. Thank you so much. I promised one last question, and then we'll have to wrap it up today. Uh, Robert Coppinger with Spaceflight Magazine. Hello. Um, so the, the recommendations are not going to come until the end of July. Are you not going to get anything into the FY24 budget for follow-on work? And um, for Dr. Evans, are you going to lead the collaboration, any collaboration with the UK Space Agency, because you're British? And also, um, uh, Carlin Toner, could you, I think I heard you say the FAA might make it mandatory for pilots to, to uh, make reports about UAP. Did I hear you correctly? That's, that's all my questions. Thanks. Okay, th thanks very much. Um, well, certainly for the purposes of today, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely an American citizen. I'm a dual national. <laughs> um, let, let me get, get to, to budget questions. Uh, you know, we, we have a, a lengthy budget process. Right now, this agency is going through internal preparations for the FY25 budget request. Um, too early to, to, to say what would happen there because it's a hallmark of us, of NASA science, to really have this deep partnership with the community. And by having this august group of independent experts come in, we solidify that partnership and we look forward to their recommendations and we'll take appropriate action at the right time. Uh, too early to say which fiscal year, if any, things would slot into. And as I said earlier, it's a complicated process, federal budgeting. Uh, to your question uh, about involvement with the UK Space Agency, no, uh, we have not had any. Although, as Dr. Kirkpatrick said, we, we had a, a brief meeting last week with um, the, the Five Eyes that, that I sat in on more as a, a fly on the wall than anything, acknowledging again that there are different swim lanes and DOD and the intelligence community have vastly different interests in UAP than NASA's science program. And the second question 
about the FAA? This is Carla Toner, and, and, and I'll start, but I might turn it over to Warren Randolph um, to follow up. So we heard from our speaker this morning, our FAA surveillance expert, um, that the, the controllers do have an operational procedure to report things that they see. And I believe similarly, um, the FAA does not mandate pilots to report, but there is a volunteer reporting system, and I'll have Warren clarify that. Sure. Thank you, Warren Randolph. Uh, yes, uh, the, the system, uh, first of all, just to, uh, just to reiterate what Carlin just said and to answer the question directly, there are no plans and there are no requirements for required UAP reporting. So I want to be uh, on our airmen, so I want to be clear about that. Uh, from the federal government level, uh, there may be internal uh, reporting requirements at different operators uh, or what have you, but there is nothing uh, in the civilian uh, federal uh, government and the FAA, there is no regulatory requirements. So I want to be clear there. Now, there are voluntary reporting environments, uh, and uh, the um, uh, aviation community uh, utilizes those. One is the, <coughs> excuse me, the NASA Aviation Safety Reporting System, ASRS. Uh, there are some uh, voluntary submitted reports from flight crews as well as air traffic uh, re uh, basically citing UFO or UAP. So that's uh, in the public domain, uh, and I encourage you to take a look at that. Thank you so much. Uh, to those on the line, I do apologize for those whose questions we could not get to. You should feel free to send an email in uh, to Catherine Roloff and to me, Karen Fox, and we will try to get answers to you. Thank you so much for our panel. Uh, it's been a long day, and I think we are wrapping up now. Thank you so much. And this does conclude today's conference. You may disconnect at this time.